The purpose for uh, this session is to really provide a demo of our IV or instinct verification financial modeling tool. As you can see here on the screen, uh, this is just an example of the uh, you know uh, software that we have that we've developed. Uh, this is a scrub client and a scrub case study, uh, so we've you know protected all of the names, uh, but this is an actual client with their actual data that's in here. I'll come back to the summary page in just a second, but in order to give you some background on some of the numbers and analysis that we look at for our clients, uh, I want to go through a lot of these different tabs that are down here at the bottom of the screen. As you can see down here to start, you'll see P1, P2, and P3. So that's generally like his, hers, and ours. So if our clients have separate assets, prenuptial agreements, um, you know, different ownership of, of different assets, we can split everything up. Or if everything is joint community property, we can put it all in one tab for them. Uh, on these tabs, we'll look at a personal cash flow statement. So we'll have all of their cash flows from the various businesses that they're a part of, salaries, dividends or distributions, sale proceeds, loans to and from the business, as well as all personal or passive cash flows. So things like retirement plan contributions and withdrawals, income from their portfolio or their brokerage account, uh, properties. So that would be you know real estate expenses, rental income, life insurance premiums. And again, everything that's really passive in nature for the client. Uh, we also run everything through a mock 1040. So we'll take into account all federal and state income taxes, capital gains, um, you know, recent tax reform legislation. So that we're coming up with a fairly accurate tax liability amount on an annual basis as well. We also then look at their client's personal balance sheet broken out into major asset categories, such as the operating business, loans, personal investments, retirement plans, properties, just so we can see what's the fair market value of each of these different asset classes over time based off the assumptions that we're putting into the model. Uh, all of these numbers are in thousands. And so what we can see here is that for Matt's personal balance sheet, you know, his main asset is a, is a, a retirement plan. If we go over to his wife's balance sheet, though, we can see that because of ownership and, and some prior gifting from her parents, she actually has a, a few more assets. She has some operating businesses, she has personal investments, retirement plans, et cetera. We also look at everything from a legacy perspective. So these H tabs down here, H stands for heirs. So if our clients have set up any sort of irrevocable trusts, uh, wealth transfer strategies, gifting of assets or selling of assets to the next generation, we can put those different trust entities on these different tabs. Uh, these entities or these tabs are set up exactly the same way as the personal ones, where we'll have a cash flow statement for the trust, for example, for the Spousal Lifetime Access Trust, you can see there's some investment income, some property expenses, some life insurance premiums. And then again, on the balance sheet, be able to see the fair market value of each of those different asset classes. Again, the investment portfolio, uh, the uh, properties or the real estate that the trust owns, and then the life insurance that the uh, trust owns as well. Uh, the C1 or C tabs are for charities. So if our clients have any sort of philanthropic objectives, want to set up any sort of charitable trusts or even show something as simple as say a family foundation or a donor advice fund, we can show those different gifts or donations to charity, whether they happen today, you know, during the client's life or even at death, uh, just so we can see what's the impact of a donation or a gift to charity over the next 5, 10, 15 years from now. I'm going to skip over the business tabs for just a second. On the properties tab, this is where we'll list out all of their uh, real estate investments that they have, uh, primary home, vacation home, rental properties, land investments, whatever the situation may be. And then we can do any sort of what-if scenario that we want to with these properties. So for example, we can look at, you know, what's the growth on these properties, uh, you know, upsizing or downsizing, you know, new home purchases, selling homes, et cetera. We can also look at, you know, mortgages and refinancing opportunities, rental income, all will take into account deductibility for interest, property taxes, depreciation as applicable. On the life insurance tab, this is where we'll look at all of their policies or contracts that they may have, as well as on the annuity tab. Uh, both of these are set up the same where we'll have all of the premiums for those different policies, the death benefit, the income stream or the annuity payment stream if it's an annuity contract, and then the cash surrender value. So this way we just have a high level summary of all of their coverage, who owns it, who pays for it, and how much coverage does it actually provide. As I go back to the business tab, 
this is really our, our, I would say, our biggest differentiation uh, in the marketplace. Uh, when we look at most personal financial planning software, or really <clears throat> the ability to make personal financial decisions for entrepreneurs, usually it's only focused on their liquid assets. So stocks and bonds and cash and investment risk and those types of things. And it doesn't really factor in you know, the value and cash flows of the operating business. And so for us, what we figured out is if we're asking the entrepreneur or the entrepreneurial family group to make some big decisions, big financial decisions, we really need to evaluate the operating business because usually that operating business makes up, you know, 80, 90 percent of their their entire net worth. And so how we do that is we gather up the last three or four years of financial statements and tax returns, plug them in here to use as a credible baseline to see how well the company's trending. Is it growing? Is it you know, maintaining its profitability, those types of things. And then in any of these teal colored cells, we change around the assumptions on a go forward basis. So we can add in, for example, new revenue streams. Maybe they have new products, new branch locations, new projects that they're working on. We can adjust growth rates for all of those different revenue streams. We can also start and stop years. So we can, you know, nothing's linear in our modeling. We can show, you know, periods of high growth, no growth, even a decline in growth if we want to. We also look at, and then we basically just work our way through the financial statements. So we'll look at cost of goods sold. We can look at operating expenses and see if there's any increases or cost savings that maybe they're, they're undergoing or implementing on, ultimately so that we can come up with an EBITDA value for the business, <clears throat> as well as a pre-tax and after-tax profit margin. There's a few different sections then that we might look at for our clients, depending on you know, the industry or the company specifically. We'll have a section for deferred comp plans, supplemental executive retirement plans, just so we can see what those financial statements are going to look like whenever those plans become due and those obligations have to be paid out. We'll also then have a section for taxes. So if there's any sort of specialized credits or deductions or accelerated depreciation, those types of things that are, you know, the differences between book and tax financials, we can factor those in here so that we can come up with a Again, a fairly accurate tax, taxable income and tax liability amount on an annual basis. We also look at the cash flow uh, statement for the company. So the operating, the investing, the financing cash flow, and ultimately the net cash flow for the business. Uh, I would say this is probably the most important line item that we look at because we know that in any business, cash is king. And what we need to do is to make sure that the company is generating enough cash flow to meet all of its obligations first and foremost. So for example, can it fund operations? Can it fund its capital expenditures or its growth objectives? Can it make debt repayments? Can it be compliant with debt covenants? Can it make ownership distributions? We just need to make sure that the company is generating enough cash flow to meet all of those obligations on an annual basis. We'll also look at the balance sheet, so the different assets and liabilities for the company, as well as valuation. Uh, so we go through a few different valuation methodologies to see what is the company actually worth. Uh, this methodology here is just a DCF for a discounted cash flow. We can also look at a cap rate method if it's like a real estate holding company or an equipment leasing company. We can also look at you know EBITDA multiples or revenue multiples or book value. So just depending on whatever the industry is that the company operates in, we'll select one of these methods to come up with the value of the business so that we can put a stake in the ground to see what's the company worth today and what's it projected to look like over the next you know, three, five, 10, 15 years from now. We then aggregate everything on the summary page so that our clients and, and really their advisor team as well can see what is you know, the most important uh, you know, numerical data that we're, we're aggregating. Uh, what we found is it's helpful to look at pictures as opposed to relying on you know, 10 or 15 different spreadsheets and trying to make decisions. So I'm just gonna go through a couple of the main graphs here today. Uh, this one here just shows their personal net worth broken out in a major asset category. As you can see, a majority of this client's net worth is tied up in their operating business, uh, but they've actually done a pretty good job of diversifying out into other income producing assets over time. We also have a chart to look at an aggregate of all of their operating businesses. Uh, 
So for the purposes of this demo, I just went through one business tab and looked at the cash flows and valuation, but we can look at the other businesses as well. We can also add more businesses if necessary. So anytime a client's a, you know, a partner or a minority owner, majority owner of a business, we can list out those different businesses and then be able to look at all of the companies in an aggregate basis and see what's the total EBITDA, enterprise value, equity value, and then the green bar represents their share. So what do they own collectively of all of those different operating businesses? We also have a chart to look at their personal free cash flow. So this looks at all of their cash inflows and outflows, uh, subtracts out all of their you know, household and lifestyle expenses, income taxes, and debt repayments, basically to see what's left over at the end of the year that should be available for investment. Uh, you can see here, you know, we're able to see is there a surplus or a deficit <clears throat> in terms of free cash flow on an annual basis. We also look at their core capital or really their financial security. So for us, core capital is the amount of assets that are needed in order to sustain their lifestyle goals. In the case of this client, it was calculated as $25,000 a month of net after tax spend. We then present value all those future tomorrows. We use a discount rate. We also adjust for inflation in order to see what is their core capital need or what's this black line here. And you can see it's about $10 million in, in this example. We then compare it to the solid blue line, which represents their after-tax personal net worth. So if they monetized everything, what would they have access to uh, in terms of, of you know, net after-tax assets? And then we also compare it to this dash green line, which represents their liquid net worth plus the present value of income producing assets. So that way they're really able to see, you know, when do they cross over this black line with their liquid net worth? Because that's really the point where they've moved from I need more to I have enough and effectively reach that point of financial freedom and flexibility where they can, they no longer relying on the operating business in order for them to be financially secure. We'll also look at their spouse security. So we're able to see if they're a surplus or a deficit in terms of spousal net worth relative to the spouse security need. We can also adjust this whenever we're looking at life insurance planning. So we can easily see is there a surplus or a deficit if they do have insurance or if they don't have insurance and use this to really look at insurance as a math equation as opposed to a best guess. And so we can really you know, match up the asset of the insurance with the liability that it's protecting against. We also look at estate liquidity. So again, making sure that there's enough liquid assets, which is the blue line, to cover that estate tax liability or the projected estate tax liability, which is the red line. And then see again, is there a surplus or a deficit in terms of liquid assets to pay that estate tax liability? We also look at their net to heirs. So the total family capital, how much goes to their kids, which is the dark blue, how much goes to the government, which is the red, and then if they had any charitable or philanthropic objectives, how much goes to charity. This is over a 10-year time frame, but we do have the ability to go out 20 years, 30 years, or even 40 years if we want to. Uh, for our perspective, you know, the goal here is just that hindsight is 2020, and so what we want to do is to make sure that uh, we're, you know, mitigating some of these future problems that we may see down the road. For example, in this client situation, they may be faced with a $21 million estate tax liability uh, when they're 87 and 86 years old. Are there some strategies or, you know, solutions that we can implement on today in order to mitigate some of these issues that we see down the road? We also can, then can dive into, you know, specific assets. So if we look at GST exempt assets or GST non-exempt assets, and we can specify what year we want to look at and how does that change, you know, the slice or the allocation of those assets over time. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, just that our modeling is very dynamic in nature, so that we're actually able to forecast and implement on different what-if scenarios and see what's the ripple effect of those decisions. So for example, if I go in here and show what's the impact of them monetizing or selling their business uh, you know, in a given year, we can put that in and then go back to these summary pages and instantly see how do things change. So now you can see their liquid net worth is well above their financial security line. How does that affect things like spouse security or estate liquidity? What's their net after tax cash flows from the sale? All of those different what if scenarios that we're able to forecast out and model because what we felt is that entrepreneurs are faced with a lot of questions constantly. You know, should I do this? Should I do that? 
And then ultimately, what's the financial impact of those decisions? And for us, what we wanted to do is to really use this as a tool in order to help our clients make some of those key decisions and see what's the impact or the ripple effect of, of those decisions and know what they're saying yes to or what they're saying no to. The last thing I wanted to show is just that we also run everything through a Monte Carlo analysis. So we run a thousand different simulations based off of the historical returns of the capital markets. Each of these gray lines represents a 1% probability on their net worth. The blue line represents the average of the outcomes, and then the red line represents, you know, 90% confidence or almost a 10% worst case scenario, because we know that the market's not always going to grow. There's going to be ups and downs. And so in this example, we're just trying to show that over a, you know, 10 year time period.